in recent years there's been a shift towards Wayland, but Exorg is still going to exist for a very, very long time as both an alternative to Wayland, but also for things like X Wayland, for example. But Exorg, in the form that we know today, has only really existed since 2004, but it has a much, much longer history stemming decades back, decades before Linux, and literally before Linus even entered high school. Now, for the sake of ease, when I say X, I'm referring to the entire X windowing system, the protocol, the different implementations available. If I mean any specific thing, I will mention that specific thing. So our story begins way before X was even close to being formed, all the way back in 1979 at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, better known as MIT. Now, there was a man named Michael Dertozos, and he proposed a project to the university president, Jeremy Weisner. And this project, looking back on it, seems really obvious, like, why wouldn't you want to do this? But at the time, was still kind of revolutionary. He felt like students need to be given access to the mainframe computers, as this would help with their education. Because at the time, undergrads didn't use computers at all except in the case of Core 6 Computer Science. Now, nothing really happened until 1982, when the School of Engineering acquired their own hardware, and then James's successor, Paul E. Gray, decided to agree to the project, as he felt like this would benefit the entire university. And to make this happen, IBM agreed to donate some hardware to everyone except the School of Engineering, because they acquired their own already. Then, as of 1983, Project Athena formed, and this project had a few simple goals. Develop computer-based learning tools that are usable in multiple educational environments. Establish a base of knowledge for future decisions about educational computing. Create a computational environment supporting multiple hardware types and encourage the sharing of ideas, code, data, and experience across MIT. And from this Project Athena, came the X windowing system, initially created by Jim Geddes of Project Athena and Bob Scheifler of the MIT Laboratory of Computer Science. And the goal of the X windowing system was to run local apps on remote resources and have a platform independent graphical system. But why the name X? Well, even though this was the 80s, X was by no means the first graphical display server, and the original X display server was actually a port of another display server called W that ran on the V operating system. I'm not joking, those are real things. Programmers in the 70s and 80s were terrible at naming things. But the initial port wasn't great, even considering the time. It ran about one-fifth of the speed of the version running on V. So to address this, they switched from being a synchronous protocol into an asynchronous protocol in 1984. And then this version is what became known as X version 1, which you may want to refer to as X1. Over time, a bunch of things improved, like in 1985, where color support was added for X9, and then by X10 in 1986, outside organizations began asking to use X. At the time, the way they handled this is they would license it out to them for a fee. But nowadays, that's not the way we distribute X. Nowadays, anybody can go and download the Xorg server, they can use X Wayland, they can use any part of X entirely for free. This change happened in X10 R3, so revision 3 or release 3. I'm not sure what the R actually stood for. What happened here is they changed the license to what we now know as the MIT license. This is where everything changed. It went from other universities asking to use X to it actually being a widespread thing. Companies like DEC and HP started using it. There were people porting it over to Apollo, Sun, IBM PCAT, but X10 started to show its limits. They realized that it needed a more hardware neutral design. So Smokey Wallace, which is an amazing name, of DEC Western Software Laboratory and Jim Geddes began work on X11. And then 15th of November, 1987, 
X11 was finalized under the same MIT license. Hold up a second. So in three years, we went from X1 to X11. Yes, so the reason why it went like this is like with the naming of projects, nobody understood version numbers yet. So instead of having like, you know, version 1.1.10 or something like that, every time there was a major update, they just incremented the number. If they wanted to do some like minor updates, they would use revisions, they would use R something. This is why we went up so many numbers so quickly, and after X11 happened, basically they stopped doing that and focused more on R something. For example, right now, the latest stable release is X11 R7.7. At this point, X was getting a little bit too big and a little bit too popular to keep being managed as part of a general project like Project Athena. So in 1988, a dedicated non-profit vendor group was formed. This was called the MIT X Consortium. And this kept going on for about another five years until the project wanted to depart from MIT, where a new organization was formed called the X Consortium Inc. Now, ignore the ink part of their name, they are still a non-profit. This departure happened in 1993, and then four years later, another organization took over the project. In 1997, the project was passed along to the Open Group, which you might know nowadays as the group which will verify a system as being a Unix trademark system. And then a year later, they ruined it. Keep this in mind, this is a recurring theme. So in 1998, with X11 R6.4, they wanted to change the license. They didn't want to go over to something like, you know, a GPL style license, or maybe try to find something more open than MIT. What they wanted to do is add a term where if you're a non-commercial user, so you're just like educational use, an individual user, things like that, then it would be completely free. But for commercial use, there would be a fee attached. And this led to the demise of the project in September of 1998. But not really, because nowadays we're still using X. So during that period, another really important project was formed, Linux in 1991. Now until a year later in 1992, there were all of these different implementations of the X display server for all of these different types of Unix. But over time, very quickly in fact, Linux sort of ate up the entire market share of Unix, with the exception of macOS, which were already doing their own thing. So in 1992, a new project was formed inside of the existing X project called X386. They were a member of the X consortium. And when the open group took over, they didn't exactly like them. So for about the past six years, X386 has been a member of the X Consortium at the $5,000 subscription level. The funds have been paid by other members of the X Consortium. This is a minute fraction of the funds needed for continuing development of the test suites and for development and enhancements. Several million dollars are needed for that effort. Now that X is part of the open group, it competes for funding with DCE, Internet Dial Tone, Java, and other activities, many of which the system vendors still the main funders see as more important than improving X because they've yielded the desktop fight to Microsoft. The cash hemorrhage is made worse by the non-fee paying X386. Although it may be out of claim several million users, the net contribution to the development of the X window system as embodied by specs, protocols, or cash is a flat zero. At this time in 1998, X386 was the main implementation of X, both on Linux, on the various BSDs, it's basically the way that you used X at the time. The reason for the open group relicensing is the X consortium was hemorrhaging money, but it wouldn't have fixed the problem anyway, because Linux had become the main version of Unix, and distros like Debian wouldn't have been able to ship X, so it wouldn't have fixed the problem in the first place. So X386, with its GPL compatible license, had become the main version to use X. And without a doubt, there are some early Linux users watching this who remember using X386. 
Now, after the Open Group basically tanked the project, they went on to form another organization called X.org because they still did have funding going on. And X386 was encouraged to join the organization in 1999 as an honorary member, which is not a real title, but they knew they weren't going to get any money out of X386 after basically killing the project because they weren't getting money from them, but they needed X386 to basically have any level of credibility. But nothing really changed. X.org pretty much lied dormant, and all of the work was being done under X386. But this caused a bit of a problem, because in all but name, X386 was entirely in control of the project. And in 2003, serious cracks started to form, where people started saying that X386 has a cathedral-like development model, where only certain people were given access to the repo. Not just anybody could go and commit code, only the people that they thought were good enough developers were allowed to contribute. And while it was supposedly a merit-based system, to people that weren't picked, it seemed like basically cronyism, where you're picking your friends, you're picking associates with no merits involved whatsoever. And Jim Getty, since 2000, noticed these issues forming and called for a more open development model. Then, two major events happened that spelled disaster for the project. The first one being that Keith Packard, who was a core member of the project since the MIT X Consortium days, literally since when X11 was formed, was booted from the project. The reason why he was booted is absolutely insane. He was accused of conspiring to fork X386. This is a free software project, by the way. Let's have a read of the issue. What Keith has done is among the most low-class, unprofessional, and tactless things I have ever experienced in my professional career. While still a member of the X386 core team, he has explicitly attempted to subvert X386 by soliciting individuals and corporations to create an alternative to X386. Fork the project including inviting certain core members to join him. At no time did Keith ever discuss his issues with the core team or board of directors. When confronted with his actions earlier this week, he blatantly lied to the core team about what he was doing. When his solicitation email was sent into the core team list, showing the blatant lies in his previous assertions, he stopped responding. Keith at the time did deny that he was trying to make a fork, but when he was booted from the project, he did go and make one called xwin.org. It was a fairly short-lived project, but it's still really important. The reason why it's important is the second major event, where they did the exact same thing the Open Group did. So in 2004, X386 decided to re-license the project with version 4.4. Both the FSF and Debian said this new license was incompatible with the GPL, and Theo Durat, who was the founder of OpenBSD, threatened to fork X386 himself. During this controversy, Keith Packard's project XWIN basically served as a forum for the refugee X386 developers. But this only went on for a couple of months, because From the Flames formed a new project, formed around open governance allowed anybody to join but if you're going to be a corporate member then to join you have to pay the project you don't pay to use xorg you just pay to be a member of the organization from this birthed the x.org foundation and the x.org display server this was formed primarily by the sane x386 developers along with developers over on freedesktop.org and originally the XORG display server started as a fork of X386 4.4 RC2, the last version before the license changed. And nowadays, the license is still the MIT license. Nowadays, the development has basically slowed to a crawl with a lot of the developers and a lot of the funding moving over to Wayland instead. But even so, XORG is still going to be around for a very, very long time. That's 
pretty much brings us into the modern day. Since 2004, nothing that crazy has happened. At some point in 2019, the freedesktop.org and the Xorg Foundation joined together, but that's pretty much it. It stayed as this open organization with this open management that anybody can join and anybody can develop like a good FOSS project should be. This was a really fun video to research. And if you want to hear more about the technical details, the different challenges that X faced along the way, I'll leave, I think it's like a 40 minute talk by Keith Packard in the description down below. It's really good and absolutely worth a listen. So let me know your thoughts in the comment section down below. Did you learn anything? Did you already know the entire history of X? Did you know they relicensed it twice or at least tried to? I would love to know. So if you like this video, I'm going to go and like the video. If you really like the video and you want to become one of these amazing people over here, go check out my Patreon, subscribe to something very pay linked in the description down below. I've got a podcast called Tech Over T. I've got a gaming channel called Brody Robertson Plays. That's going to be it for me and I'm out.